Hello, Lynn Flint here. Welcome to the Gateway Church podcast. On this episode, we're going to be talking all about how we can best share the truth of Jesus practically in a COVID world, which of course is a test for most of us. We're going to be looking at the physical aspects of how we can do that with people and also how we can do that digitally, as of course all our church activity has pretty much moved online now. So joining me and Matthew Hosier, who leads the team here at Gateway Church, is author, evangelist, director of Speak Life, Glenn Scrivener from Eastbourne. How are you doing, Glenn? I'm doing very well, thank you, Liam. Yeah, nice to, nice to talk to you. You guys, uh, we're, we're just along uh, on the south coast. If you just keep the, yeah, the sea on your right, you can uh, keep going to Eastbourne. And when the sandy beaches run out, you know that you've, uh, you've come to Eastbourne and we're just full of pebbles here. It's, uh, it's terrible. As an Australian living in the UK, it was just the, the, the day that I heard that Eastbourne City Council actually desires to have shingle on its beach. They actually ship it in specially. Um, I just lost all faith in humanity yeah. at that point. I just thought, we keep it so you, you guys have much better beaches. We do. Well, we didn't want to have to say that, but thank you for being humble enough to admit that. I mean, Matt, we do love... We our- have more sunshine, though. We do have more sunshine. I think Eastbourne has the, the most amount of sunshine in, in mainland yeah, UK. It's all slightly, relative, of course. I think we're slightly warmer. <laughs> is that right? Oh, okay. Yeah. My Australian family thinks it's hilarious that Eastbourne is called the Sunshine Coast. You know, like, but there is a Sunshine Coast in Australia and it's, it's, it's a little different. <laughs> I thought, I thought <laughs> they actually the... call Eastbourne the Unshine Coast. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the Senility Coast. <laughs> That's true. It's, it's known for being a kind of the retirement capital, but I, I don't think it's even in the top 10 of, uh, of towns in, in terms of um, uh, retirement population. I think places like, Wor- I think Worthing is number one and Blackpool is, is right yeah, up there. So. Next Actually, hill. It's just Christchurch, just along from us. It's got the highest proportion of um, over 70s or something. Mm. Right. God's waiting room. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we've sold, we've sold the picture to them. Come to the South Coast, wherever you are. Whether you want to go and see Glenn or us, we'll uh, forgive you either way. Glenn, it's, it's so good to have you. I know you're not a stranger to podcasting um, and you do so much in the, the digital world. I'm seeing this as a bit of a day off for you. You can relax on the other end. Great. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm all ears and I, I will waffle on. If I, if I have license to waffle, um, then <laughs> waffle I will. No, that's fine. You and Matthew can waffle waffle together <laughs> just to put out the goalpost slightly just so everyone knows where we're aiming to go with this our end game today is simply we'd love to encourage and equip you as as the listener to be a light in these times and just to know practically how we can share and be on the front foot with the gospel message at the moment as i've already said it's it's a very strange time but there's also great opportunity in it as well as we'd i'm sure we'd all agree um, but matt of course we've got history with glenn glenn's visited us hasn't he in the last few years and we, we use his resources quite often. Yeah, yeah, I'm a fan of Glenn and also his wife, who's uh, been very helpful, helped some of my kids, some of their experiences of life. So grateful for Glenn and his ministry and his passion further. And right at the beginning of lockdown, um, Glenn put out a video about how to speak to camera, which we were all watching. And uh, as you know, Liam, in terms of our team, I said, we all need to watch this and apply the lessons. It was massively helpful. Thank you for that, Glenn. So as we have been learning the last three months, uh, how to position lights and cameras and microphones and all the rest that was such a uh, gave us such a bump up at the beginning in terms of some technique of that so thank you for it was that. funny it was, there are many pastors who got the tag of shame on that video because it was basically us saying here's how you speak to camera and then there were so many church members who would tag their pastor and say actually bill i think you might want to look at this <laughs> <So>. yeah <laughs> it's been a painful process learning all this stuff it is, but it never gets better. If that, if that encourages you, <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been making videos for like 10 years now and um, it's, it's always a pain. So I don't, that's, that's not the most encouraging thing to hear, but in some ways it is like, yeah. like, yeah, it's always, it's always tricky. And um, yeah, we're all learning how to adjust, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. There've been definite moments when I wanted to throw the camera through the window and <laughs> test of sanctification filming. <laughs> Yes. Are there aspects, though, Matt, as a church leader that, that you're grateful for, like in, in terms of the stuff that you've had to adjust to? Are there things that you want to carry on with, even as lockdown eases? Yeah, we've been having those conversations. I mean, I think it's certainly in terms of creativity, it's, it has created more creativity. And I think definitely accelerated things that we talked about. So like doing the podcast we talked about and hadn't got around to, it forced us to do that. So I think creativity in terms of online stuff and video stuff we're much further ahead now than we would have been and 
there's a lot more we think we can develop stuff which we perhaps we wouldn't have had the courage or the energy to get to previously but but now are so i think that's that's all good and although and i hate the not actually being physically with people i think being on camera does force you to think about the individual that you can't think about addressing a crowd and i think you said that in your first video that you've really got to think in terms of i'm speaking to one person here and so i've got to try and connect with them and that, that that's that's a helpful thing to learn and develop i think so yeah there's definitely some positives out of it but i'm i'm eager to get back in a room with some people yes amen to that yeah <laughs> Okay, well, we can have a spin-off show if you want, a digital masterclass with you two. I'm sure that would get, get much love. Um, always really keen to know, Glenn, as an evangelist, of course, you know, your job is to tell people, your passion is to tell people about Jesus. But then there must have been a point for you where that message hit home for you for the first time to then inspire you to do that. Could you just give us a, a little snippet of what happened to you uh, to make you acknowledge Jesus and then go on this mission to I want to tell as many people as possible. Yeah. Um, I don't know when the moment happened. I think it happened sometime in the 1990s. Um, whether it happened at the begin beginning of the decade or at the end of the decade, I'm not quite sure. Um, so at the beginning of the decade, I was a, I was a good Christian sort of teenager um, and went to, you know, lots of Christian camps and was told to give my life to God and, and sort of did so. Um, and expected there to be a funny feeling in my stomach or a light behind my eyes or a halo above my head or some kind of sense that God had accepted me. I kept on giving my life to God and I wasn't really sure whether um, he was receiving um, this beneficent gift of mine. Um, but so that, therefore I just kept on, you know, praying and praying and praying and praying. I, I think I gave my life to God a thousand times in my teenage years um, and getting ever more, um, angry actually that god didn't seem to be um receiving my gift to him and I, and it was this this idea that you know christianity is the arrow up and i need to perform before god and so actually aged 18 i left home and left my faith behind and, and i wasn't planning on coming back actually and, until a friend challenged me to read through the gospels and kind of figure out okay but who is jesus actually and um the passage in the Bible that had always haunted me was the Garden of Gethsemane. And there in Gethsemane, Jesus, as I read it as a teenager, Jesus was giving his life to God, wasn't he? And so what should I do? Well, what would Jesus do? I had the bracelet, just like every Christian teenager had the bracelet. What would Jesus do? And I thought my job was to copy Jesus and to give my life to God in ever more melodramatic ways. And this is what I was doing. For those thousand times I was giving my life to God, I was basically trying to do Gethsemane myself and saying god take me use me your will be done and that was at the heart of actually why i walked away from god because i just thought god was all demand and no gift so my friend challenged me to read through the gospels and we got to the bit of the garden of gethsemane and i, and I said i can't handle this passage because i can't do it like jesus did it and my friend said glenn do you think you're jesus and i said no well, you know, not in every regard but you know aren't we aren't we meant to copy jesus you know isn't it what would jesus do my friend said no you got it backwards glenn you are not jesus in that passage you are peter and what is peter doing in the garden of gethsemane he's sleeping he's failing rubbish peter and jesus prays for him and that was a real um eye-opening moment that was a real penny dropping moment moment for me when i was like ah it's not about my life offered to god it's actually about christ's life offered for me mm -hmm in my name, on my behalf, as my champion, as my savior. Um, and that God is primarily a God of gift. Um, and receiving Jesus in that moment was just 180 degrees different to the kind of spirituality that, that I, I, I thought was at the heart of the Christian life. I thought it was arrow up. And now I'm realizing Jesus is a gift to me. So that happened at the end of the 1990s. And so w when, when did I become a Christian? I don't know. At some, at some stage in the 1990s, maybe God heard all my thousand prayers. And his answer was to give me that moment. Or maybe I didn't really get it until that moment. Either way, um, you know, God, God had his man. And uh, I, um, yeah, gladly um, started shooting my mouth off about Jesus um, from that time onwards. And so I guess the last 20 years of my life have, have been about getting excited about Jesus and, and trying to get other people excited too.
Mm-hmm. It's that experience of grace, isn't it, which does transform everything when you do really realize and feel, know that it's not about what we're doing, but what Jesus has done for us. We had Terry Virgo on a few weeks back talking about prayer and uh, he tells that story as well in terms of suddenly understanding the grace of God, understanding God's gift to him and how that was the thing that liberated him in terms of starting to enjoy prayer and that being so central to his life. It is completely transformative, isn't it? When you, when, when yeah. you grasp, hey, this is given to me. It's not about what I'm earning, not what I'm doing. It's about what Christ has done for me and re- receiving that. Yeah. I recently I got to preach on the the three Abba fathers of the New Testament, which is fascinating because the the first Abba father, first time that, you know, the phrase Abba father um, crops up in the New Testament is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there is Jesus. He is the obedient son. He gets to call the most high dad right? He, he's allowed to do that. Who else is allowed to do that? Well, then you go through to Galatians chapter four, and there it says, the spirit of the son is crying out in our hearts, Abba, Father. So the spirit of the son gets to pray, Abba, Father. Mm. Um, and then in Romans 8 verse 15, we get to join in. Now, by the spirit of the son, we cry, Abba, Father. And it's that sense, you, it's, it, you can't short circuit it. You can't go straight from Jesus said, Abba, Father, now I'll have a go. It's, it's <laughs> Jesus did it in my name and on my behalf. Now the spirit places Christ's prayer inside me. And now I add my own amen to the perfect prayer of Jesus. And I'm wrapped up in the love of God. It's not my offering. It's actually being included in Christ so that now I'm carried to the throne. Um, so that experience of grace, that, that's what will unlock prayer, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And unlocks evangelism when you understand that what we're what we've received as a gift and what we're offering as a gift, not, not more uh, do this, do this, do this. Right. Right. And, and it also makes me think I need to evangelize Christians because I was a good Christian kid, you know, outwardly speaking, all throughout my teenage years. I was a good Christian kid who wasn't getting grace. So I needed to be evangelized and I continue to need to be evangelized. I, I continue to need to be told um, it's about Christ for me, you idiot, Glenn. It's about Christ for me. I need to preach to myself. I need to evangelize myself. I need to evangelize other Christians. And I think so often, we think the evangelist's job is to leave the church behind, go out into the world and tell them all about Jesus. Ephesians 4 says that Christ has given the church, you know, apostles, prophets, pastor, teachers, and evangelists to equip God's people for their works of service, which is fascinating because you, you think that the evangelist has, has, their back toward, has their back to the church and is just facing the world. And Ephesians 4 actually says, no, the evangelist is equipping the church to be the great missionary body because it's the church that's going to reach the nations, not these little lone ranger evangelists. Um, we must get out of their head the idea of the lone ranger evangelists. If there are capital E evangelists and there are, their job is to equip the missionary body that is the church to do its job of reaching the nations. It's not about forgetting the church and reaching the world. It's equipping the church to reach the world. Mm. Wow. So, Glenn, from your point of view, I'm thinking with coronavirus at the moment and the way that's completely changed the the landscape for us, someone like yourself who's so tuned in digitally, it's your ministry, you're very good at the messages using YouTube, social media, videos. Audience has been driven almost completely online where you are thriving. So in a strange way, is it full of opportunity for you? Um, You certainly... um you want to frame this in terms of silver linings. There are silver linings to um, the dreadful catastrophe of 43,000 people, you know, dying of, of COVID um, here in this, in this country. And that, that is, um, that is a terrible tragedy. And, and, um, and this is not meant to, to, to sound as, as though the benefits somehow outweigh those great tragedies, because I don't, I don't think it works like that, but there are, there are certainly, um, opportunities that happen within the crisis that is COVID-19. And certainly there are a lot of people, um, there are a lot more eyeballs out there who are ready to watch content. Um, And there are a lot more people who um, have been disabused of the myth that they are immortal. Um, And I I think most people today, even if you're under the age of like, 70 <laughs> you think you're immortal you know um here i am in eastbourne i was i was like talking to a guy about jesus um last year 
and evangelizing him. And at some stage, he said, well, if you believe in a good God, you explain this to me. Why is it that my mother and father both died last year? Like, you know, God took them away last year. And one thing you need to know about this guy is that he was at least 65 years old. <laughs> and it was a shock to him that he might lose his parents. In other ages, they dream of living to 65 years old. He was shocked that his parents would die, probably in their 90s. Um, it, it, it absolutely shocks us that we are mortal. Um, and so what do we have every, every day at 5 p.m.? We have this national moment in which the death toll is read out and we are reminded <laughs> that we have a limited number of, of heartbeats and they are running out one by one. Um, and nobody thinks about that. I, I think it's, it's one of the biggest blockages to evangelism in our day is that in the West, we don't see death. So why are we going to want to hear about the risen one? Why are we going to want to hear about, about Christ who has triumphed over the grave when we don't really think death is an enemy? It, it is an enemy. It's the last enemy, according to the Bible. And yet in modern 21st century culture, especially, you know, in Australia, in the UK, um, so much of our culture is to shift the elderly out of sight, out of mind, into nursing homes, out of, out of even the family's eye. And... Um, people die alone in nursing homes and the great tragedy during COVID-19, so many are buried even alone, mm. out of sight, out of minds. And we, we just don't see death anymore. Mm. So COVID-19 is awakening us to um, our own mortality, our own fragility. And it certainly made people um, curious about things like prayer. You know, there's been a massive spike in Google searches for prayer, um, more than at any other stage since Google has been, um, you know, recording these things. So people, people are wanting to pray, people are accessing online services, and people are starting to, uh, to ask the big questions about fear, about fragility, about mortality. And another thing people are really thinking about now, especially as lockdown starts to ease, is we had thought it'll be nice when we have the barbecue you know, we had thought, um, well, this is tough, but won't it be nice when we have the street party? And I think we're beginning to see that some of this is because, you know, lockdown is messy. And some of this is just because barbecues and street parties are not sufficient to satisfy the human soul. I think we're all starting to think, what on earth is my life about? I locked down in order to preserve my life, in order to prolong my life. But now what is, is, is life just the ability to go to the barbecue, go to the football, go to the movies? Is, is, is that really what life is about? People are asking those deep questions. So uh, yeah, it's never been better for evangelism, I think. <laughs> I really like the way you, yeah, you phrase that. Definitely silver lining. Matt, of course, I think one of the most Google questions at the minute will be if coronavirus, then surely God can't exist. You know, if God was loving, this wouldn't be happening as a pastor. And, you know, as congregation, we get asked that it's really hard to satisfy that because ultimately we don't have the mind of God. But what would you be saying to people who come to you with that with that issue at the moment? <laughs> oh, the question of suffering. Yeah, the, the three S's of apologetics, science, mm. sex and suffering, the three that always get talked about. And there's obviously a huge amount you can talk about in terms of, of suffering. Uh, I think kind of turn it around a little bit. I think one of the issues, and, and Glenn's really alluded to it in his, what he was just saying, is that our whole um, framework of how we measure life and how we measure risk actually is very poor. We, 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 we don't expect to die. Uh, I pretty much gave up on the 10 p.m. news quite early on into the crisis when they led it with a, hun a woman of 108 has died of COVID. She was 108. <laughs> it's not really a surprise, perhaps, that she has uh, died. So I think we're just really poor at measuring risk generally. And um, yeah, I think what the crisis has done is it does show things, things happen, unpredictable, that we're not as in control of life as we'd like to think we are. So I think that's an important thing to emphasize. Look, we think we've got life sorted. We think with our technology and our systems and our processes, we can just predict stuff and it will happen. And this has shown that's not the case. That raises some big questions. Are humans as in control as they think they are? And um, then I think the, way, the response to it, we can see in, I and mean, everybody will have different opinions about how the government has handled it and how different governments and different nations have handled it and who's done better and who's done worse. 
again, exposes the limitation of human power and of human knowledge that the scientists can't agree. There's, as we talked about on this before, Liam, there's some scientists saying we should have more lockdown, other scientists saying we shouldn't have any lockdown at all. Uh, follow the science doesn't actually mean much because there are a spectrum of scientific opinions. There's not a correct way that everybody agrees oh, but with. matthew in the, in all the articles it's capital t capital s the science the science yeah <laughs> do you disagree with the science the science <laughs> but nobody knows what the science is so i, I think know, I know. So, so i think we turn all that around and say well look there's so much uncertainty H humans think we're so wise we're exposed as being actually so flimsy um we think we should live forever actually we don't what is solid what is reliable is the unchanging rock of ages, which is, is Christ Jesus. He is the one who contains all the answers. He, he is the answer to, to our questions, to our searching. So I, I can't answer every question about suffering, certainly not every individual case. I can tell a narrative. I know the story in terms of why suffering has entered the world, mm -hmm. consequence actually of our turning against God and everything being distorted. Uh, but what I would want to do is point people towards what I have found to be rock solid and reliable rather than what is shifting and contested and who knows what's really going on. So um, that, that'd be some and of the way I try and process that. Do you think Matthew, because certainly as an evangelist, I don't, I think the suffering question is being asked, but I don't think it's being asked as how could a good God allow that as though we're kind of shaking our fist at the heavens and, and, and wondering, you know, why I thought you loved us. It does seem to me that even from a secular point of view, all the op-eds in the newspapers and all the articles that are being written are about what can we learn from COVID-19 and what is, and they, they'll frame it in terms of what is nature teaching mm -hmm. us um, and how can we adjust to the new normal and, and maybe this is a course correction. You know, even, um, even totally secular people, they're using secular language, but they're basically saying, this is an opportunity for learning and repentance even. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested. And, and I think that is because um, we are facing our mortality. We're, we're realizing that life really is quite serious and that it's probably not God's job to simply um, allow us to watch Netflix until we're 98 years old and then to take us quietly in our sleep. We're, we're probably realizing that life is not like that. And we're probably not expecting that of God as much and that's what happens around the world you know in the places that really suffering in the places where people really suffer they're not shaking their fist at the heavens the places that really suffer around the world um are the places that believe in god all the more mm. um because people who are living hand to mouth and people who really suffer they don't they don't expect an easy life and they don't think that the goodness of god is tied to you know whether whether i can navigate this world frictionlessly or not they find meaning in suffering and they believe in a god who makes meaning of suffering um, because so many of them believe in the jesus story where god enters into suffering um, and i think in some senses we're catching up to the rest of the world during a time of pestilence, during a time of plague, we're catching up to the rest of the world that, that constantly has to deal with their own mortality and the fact of suffering. And we're realizing that the, the whole hedonistic idea that life is all about pleasure, that's just gone out the window. Um, and I think we're, we're getting more serious about what life is about. Um, and I, I think one thing that's shown us that we're seeing life differently is that at the beginning of lockdown, we thought that lockdown would end with a party and actually lockdown is ending with protests. And I, I find that very interesting that we, we realize that life is not about pleasure, that there are things that are far more important than pleasure, like meaning, like virtue, like goodness, like justice. And so actually what trumps lockdown is not a greater pleasure because pleasure is not really where, where we're gonna find meaning. Um, what trumps pleasure is virtue, is justice, is goodness is something far more meaningful. Um, and so as people are wrestling with the question of suffering, I think, I think we're getting a lot more realistic. I think, I think we're, not, we're not so quick to conclude that because I'm not enjoying pleasure, therefore God must be nasty. I think we're far more asking questions like, okay, what is God up to in this displeasing scenario? What is God up to? in lockdown? What is God up to? What is God saying through all this? I think those are more the questions that are being asked. And I think that's, that's healthy. And that 
need for meaning and for a savior is very much seen in the response to the NHS, wasn't it? So as has been said, the NHS is the closest thing to a national religion that we now have in the UK. And, and, and the way that the whole language of protect the NHS, which is kind of strange because actually the NHS is there to protect us, but we've got to protect the NHS and uh, all out applauding on Thursday nights and, and all that, that stuff that this desire to have a, a saving force that can intervene in our lives and, and, and we had to protect the NHS because we knew it might fall over, whereas with the, with the Lord, we don't have to protect God. <laughs> the true saviour right. is quite capable of looking after himself. <laughs> right, right. It's so funny, as an Australian living in the UK, you, you, as, as, an, as a foreigner in a foreign land, um, you do get a sort of an outside perspective. You know, as, as soon as I arrived in the UK, I realised that the NHS was like the national religion of the UK. It's just so obvious, just in, in all the, you know, and it's only, it's only now in the last few months that, you know, my English friends are all catching. Do you think the NHS is, do, do you think we might idolize the NHS? <laughs> like every foreign person living in the UK is like, you think? <laughs> like, you think? Of course you do. <laughs> um, which, is, which is not to say that we don't applaud frontline health workers and we love our doctors and nurses and we love our hospitals and we think they're doing a great job. But this, this thing has has taken on a greater significance than the sum of its parts, I think. And, and there is something religious about that. I, I agree. We need a, a greater savior, even than the NHS. <laughs> We've got one. We've got one. Isn't that good? Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we could talk about this for the next hour or so. I'm, I feel like this could, we could go on so many different topics. It'd be amazing. Um, I'd love to just tie this back to where we're at the minute. I think, I'm just thinking about Matt and I in the last few weeks. We've played around with lots of equipment. We've tried new streaming productions. We've had podcasts. We've had this and that. So much that we wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, and I just love to pick your, your, your brains on this, Glenn. Are you very optimistic that when we come out the other side of this, that church, like the big C, capital C church, will be far more effective in digital evangelism, even physical evangelism, because we've actually got out on the streets we've seen neighbors we've done lots of things in community do you think we could be in a good position to address the need off the back of this because of all these new things we're picking up now yes i'm i am optimistic in in those ways i mean before we locked down you know i, I just put a little flyer through every door on our street and we started a whatsapp group and that's that's still going strong you know three months later and uh invited them to church and and some of them have, have you know hopped onto you know online services um I, I think you know certainly our our church has seen you know many more people tuning in online than we've seen you know in the building at the time um and obviously you know, all that what we've been saying is that in the storm of COVID-19, people's assurances of life are being revealed and our foundations are being revealed and people are realizing that they're building on sand. And I think there's, there's a greater hunger for the rock of ages for Jesus. So all those things are to the good. But, you know, I think we, we don't want to remain excarnational. Um, you know, one of the great criticisms of evangelicalism is that we, we, we tend not to incarnate. We tend to be about doctrine and ideas and a spiritual reality that is not embodied and physical. Um, and so I think, I think we'll need to work hard at um, reintegrating together in physical ways, meeting physical needs. I think, I think what we should be aiming for in our online services on a, on a, um, on a Sunday that the meetings I think need to have a, a deep element of um, interplay, a deep element of uh, responsiveness. You need to be using the, the chat facilities. You need to be, um, you know, responding to people in the moment rather than offering them a production. Cause my, my great fear is um, as lockdown eases um, showing up to church on a Sunday will, it, it won't be like, click a finger and 200 people can, you know, stand in the same room and sing together and drink from the same cup. It won't be like that. And we're starting to see that it won't be like that. So why would someone show up at 10 o'clock to your church service when actually they've got to be socially distanced by two meters, nobody can sing, you can't take communion. Um, probably there's no kids work. And so probably a lot of families aren't there. The elderly are shielding. Do you want to show up on church? Do, do you really want to 
be embodied in your worship of God and meet together with brothers and sisters? Or do you want to stay on your sofa and simply receive the, the production that, that church has been feeding to you for the last 12 weeks? Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people will just want to stay on the couch um, and simply receive and simply consume. So I think there's a, there's a big question um, for churches. We, I think we need to be... Um, we need to be very engaged with our people um, so that when the doors really do fling wide open, uh, people will get off the sofa and come and come together into church. Um, so that, that's, that's my big caveat, but overall, yes, I'm very hopeful. I, I think, I think pastors have like raised their game insanely. Like pretty much every pastor in the UK has now got to the level of they they know how to stream from Zoom to YouTube or something like that, you know, um, or however they've they've done their online church. Um, and there'll be many um, many things that people will hold on to post lockdown that will be really beneficial. Um, webinars that people can can hold, doing an alpha course, doing a Christianity Explored course online. Um, there'll be, there'll be many different things that people, there'll be, you know, videos that you can use on a Sunday and, uh, being more creative with our video content, um, using Facebook a lot better to engage your locality. I think every, every single pastor in the whole country has raised their game immensely over the last three months. And that can all be, um, for the good. So over, overall, I'm, I'm very optimistic, but I, I think we do need to, um, not get comfortable with excarnational Christianity and we need to throw ourselves back into embodied worship together. Yeah. Yeah. And managing that is going to be complex because it's going to be a long process, isn't that with the limitations on size of gatherings and not being able to sing and all that kind of stuff, how you do that. Now here we're starting to really encourage people just to meet in gardens in groups where you can do that. Just, just to start to be together and see people face to face again. because so we've all got trained in not doing that. And I think especially for uh, lots lots of us British who tend to there can be more reserve anyway than there would be in a Brazilian culture or something uh, people who got very thoroughly trained after the, over the last three months of, of keeping distance haven't they so there's going to be a lot of re-education to do in terms of learning to actually come together again and and be physically proximate to one another so it's going to be challenging mm-hmm. yeah and it's going it's to take courage um, and but I, but I think we're hungry for it. I think we, we realize that, you know, a Zoom chat, you're only engaging two of the five senses and um, you're, you're hungry for those other three. And I, and I yeah, I, I hope that not only Christians, but also non-Christians will, will be hungry for that kind of family, that kind of intimacy, that kind of, uh, that kind of meeting of not only minds, but, but bodies and souls um, together. I, th- I, think, I think overall starved of that physical connection and being force fed Netflix for three months. I think it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the, the, that method of, of teaching Johnny not to smoke cigarettes. You know, you catch Johnny with one cigarette, you say here, you know, smoke the whole packet. Um, and Johnny goes green. Um, I, I think it's kind of like that with our net Netflix addiction. <laughs> That's kind of been like God's God said to us, you like Netflix, do you here have all the Netflix in the world. And I think, I think we're quite sick of it. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be ever more hungry for that kind of embodied true community that church offers. Yeah. So much meat on this. And yeah, Glenn, you put it perfectly there. There is a great opportunity that we can all take, all do our part in whatever means we can by just sharing the message. So that's been really helpful. Thank you so much, Glenn, for your insights. Pleasure, Liam. Yeah. Great to be with you. And great to be with you, Matthew. Hey, thanks, Glenn. Appreciate it.